headset gave me a thumbs up. Um, and yep, uh, re recording has started, so I think uh, I think we're ready to go. Great. Well, um, I, I just want to point out. I know uh, Brian's a humble guy, but um, a great call on Monday by Brian. Um, I feel like the edge, uh, the edge data has really proved true in this. <laughs> And um, with that, I want to introduce Brian Wilson and uh, let him take the floor. Thank you, Henry. Good to, good to see everyone today. Hope you guys are having a great Thursday. Um, I live in Colorado Springs and we're having a typical spring day. Uh, Henry would know what I'm what I'm talking about. Uh, it's about 35 degrees outside and raining and wind blowing sideways. Uh, in, in other words, springtime in Colorado, and it'll probably be 70 tomorrow, uh, but it's just, just the way it goes here. Uh, but once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll start off today. We'll switch over to Henry, and then we'll probably have a, like a shared section in terms of what we're uh, expecting uh, going forward. Uh, I was looking at some of the material that I wanted to cover today, and I thought I would start off with, um, well, let me share my document first. That would help. Um, I thought I would start off with something that I did back in uh, November. I found this document and I thought, oh, this would actually be helpful to kind of review again. And I won't spend a lot of, a lot of time on this, but I wanted, what I wanted to show you is some of the ways that, that EDGE has helped me. And I'll br just briefly look at this and please reach out to me via, via email. Uh, it's bw at marketstructureedge.com. Uh, if you have any questions about any of any of these specific points. Uh, but but for me and and recognize that I come from a buy side trading background. So I was a buy side trader for about nine or ten years. But even with that background, I found I found myself stepping into a lot of mistakes as a trader. And these are some of the things that I've been able to correct just by using edge here uh, during the last two to three years. Uh, one of them is I don't have to guess at market tops and bottoms. Uh, I know by the data uh, when we're nearing a top, when we're nearing a bottom. Uh, and just as a review for those who are new to edge, uh, you can see that on broad market sentiment. You can see it with the green and the red lines. Uh, I like to think of the red line as the market getting stretched to a certain degree, getting a little bit overbought. Green line is definitely, you know, the market becoming uh, oversold. So those market tops and bottoms really uh, help me a lot. Uh, there's a predictable cadence to the market. And by that, I mean that market cycles tend to track both options expiration cycles, that's on a monthly basis, or to a certain extent, both monthly or quarterly cycles. You can, you can see month to month transitions where strategies and tactics can change. And you can see that with expirations uh, as well. In terms of how you can look at that, if you're on the Edge platform, uh, just go to using Edge, how it works. And then once that comes up, or if you just wanna go to marketstructureedge.com, you're looking for the resources tab, and then in this case, you're looking for the expirations calendar and you'll see specifically uh, when uh, expirations are occurring. Uh, for instance, right now during the month of April, you know, we're coming in 17th through the 19th and you can see that for every month. And once again, it's a very predictable cadence where you'll often see strategies in play into expirations, a lot of times they'll change afterwards. And you can see uh, as well that month end activity and all of the information is down here at the at the bottom. But if you haven't seen that before, I would recommend uh, going to that. Uh, quite simply, no, point number three, divergence and convergent, convergence works. Uh, I hope you've seen that uh, as you've looked at the edge platform. Uh, maybe I'll show you one quick example here. Uh, I was looking at uh, Apple and NVIDIA recently. I was considering buying Apple, uh, but when I saw the setup, I decided not to. And you can see what I'm talking about here. So sentiment for Apple neutral, that's great. Uh, but look at what short volume has been doing. 
Uh, so when I was considering buying Apple the last couple of days, I'm like, nah, nah I'm going to pass on that one. And you can see how, you know, price has continued to uh, deteriorate. The other uh, example, NVIDIA. Uh, I looked at this one yesterday. I actually bought it towards the close. The reason that I bought it towards the close was divergence. Uh, look at sentiment rising. Look at short volumes falling. Uh, it's been a decent play today. Once again, that concept of uh, of divergence or convergence, if you're looking to short the market, um, I, I've seen over time, and Henry can verify this as well, that it truly uh, does work. Uh, point number four quickly, and I'm probably taking too much time on these, but when you look at the momentum and low volatility portfolios, they provide clues as to what type of market we have. If you have 20 names in momentum, that's a pretty good clue that you're in the middle of a momentum market. If that if that momentum portfolio shrinks to three names, that's a pretty good clue as well. Uh, so you can get clues as to the type of market that we're, that we're in just really by looking at the number of names in the portfolios. And you can also see, uh, you know, which way they're slanted. You know, do we have 15 names in momentum that are tech right now? Well, that gives you a clue uh, as well. Uh, point number five, and I, I often need to re remind myself of this point, but there's times to be cautious and there's times to be bold. You know, this week, and hopefully we've communicated that well in the market desk notes, we're in the middle of expirations. It's it's a time to be cautious because market participants are making decisions regarding derivatives and you'll see these wild swings in the market. And we've certainly seen that uh, playing out. I'm not going to spend any time on number six. That's a bigger topic, but you have four different behaviors. Happy to unpack that with you uh, via email. Happy to get together uh, for a one-on-one -on -one meeting if you guys ever uh, you know, want that time. Henry and I both, uh, both do that. Uh, the big players in the market matter. Uh, big tech is a great example of that. And the last point, and we see this with the daily trading ideas, you know, daily volatility helps me as I enter positions. Uh, I don't have to guess whether it's with broad market positioning or with individual stocks. I know how much the volatility is for the broad market. That helps me to know when I want to enter positions. I know what the volatility is for individual stocks. Uh, so that being said, let's go take a look at the daily trading ideas, especially in relation to uh, daily volatility. And I just made up a fictitious example today, but let's say we're looking at the momentum portfolio and here's my, here's my made up example and it actually kind of ties in. Let's say that road, uh, Roblox, right? I might have the name wrong there, uh, but let's say that they're trading right now at $100 just to keep the math simple and their volatility is 3%. You know, what would I do in this environment that we've been seeing here during the last week? Uh, pr probability right now is terrific, 100%. That's looking at activity over the course of the last 90 days when we've seen similar supply and demand uh, in, terms of, in terms of the setup. What I do when the market gets really volatile is I wait for all of that volatility to come out. So in other words, it, if you have a normal trading environment, you know, and the market's been slowly churning higher over the last two, three weeks, you know, I might pick up a position at eight o'clock in the morning and I'm mountain time, but I might pick up a position eight o'clock in the morning with it down one and a half to two percent. Uh, I, I might take a half position and maybe build on that during the course of the day. If we have volatile conditions, I'm usually not touching this stock until the end of the day. Uh, it, it, unless I see that down, you know, four and a half percent, and perhaps the market is starting to stabilize a little bit. But my point if, is, is if the market gets volatile, uh, don't enter until you see all of that intraday volatility uh, come out of the name. Now, if the market is relatively stable, you know, that's when you can look at, you know, some of these low positionings and, you know, like I said, maybe one and a half to two, 2% 2 lower, you know, you can enter into some of those positions. 
But that's my normal cadence. If the market's really volatile, I'll tend to keep my buying towards the close and I'll look to buy with all that intra intraday volatility uh, out of the name under, let's call it, you know, in quotations, normal market conditions. I'll often pick up names at 30, 40 minutes into the day. Sometimes I'll pick up like like a half of a half of a position and then I'll you know add to it during the course of the day. And hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Um, I did want to, and Henry, I've got I think one more big point, and then uh, and then what's next. But we'll we can tackle what's next together. Uh, I did want to take a peek, excuse me, take a peek at this green line. Uh, we don't get down to what I call oversold conditions very often. Uh, in, in fact, when I was looking, preparing yesterday for today's meeting, uh, I was like, wow, I don't have a lot of you know, data at my fingertips for, for green line conditions. Once again, we just don't get there very often. You know, this is, a, this is the last six months. You can see, if anything, you know, we've been hugging the red line during that time. You know, market's been ripping higher. What happens when we get to the green line or go uh, underneath it? Uh, I took a peek at some of the historical numbers that uh, that I do have, and just gathered it and you know tossed it onto a spreadsheet here. So this is what conditions look like when we be one below move below five, and then that green line is when we actually move below four. Uh, this is looking at conditions from December 2017 up to June of last year, and I need to update this to present conditions. But once again, we haven't been below that green line maybe maybe one time since then. Uh, and you know, generally, what are we seeing uh, for, between four and five? And think of it think of it as where we've been here, here during the last week or so. Sentiment has fallen below neutral. The market comes under pressure, uh, and, and and you get weakness in the market. That's represented uh, over time. You know, once again, 2017 to June 2023, declines of 2.6 percent. When you actually get below that green line, you actually start to have positive market returns. In most cases, the market actually starts to bounce. Uh, and, and here's the kicker, though, if you have like a really poor, uh, poor market, real, you know, uh, a bear market, you know, we're going into the uh, COVID-19, going into the pandemic. If the market falls apart, it really falls apart. Uh, and then we hardly ever get down here. But if you get between one and two, it's about, a, you know, about a 10 basis point uh, increases. So as I was thinking about it, you know, here were my takeaways. Uh, most market losses to me occur right in this point here. You know, we just don't get down to this level very often. And I'll show you on a graph, you know, how often we get down there. Uh, market tends to bounce in this level when we get below four. Uh, and once again, though, if the market does fall apart, uh, it gets ugly. Uh, there's no denying it. Uh, you know, that that is ugly returns. And if you get caught in the middle of that, it's hard to recover that. Uh, the way that I approach it when we uh, get down below the green line is I will establish positions going long, uh, but I will average down if needed and I'll be patient. And I'm talking about a broad market perspective. I'm not talking about individual stocks. So for instance, if you wanted to buy the SPY, just as a, as a simple example, you know, I would set up a position and I would average down if I needed to. So let me show you what this looks like, and let's take this back. Let's take it back to three years. It gets a little hard to read if you go, you know, too too much below that. So look at the time frames where we get below the green line. Um, you know what? Watch what happens when we when we do that. You know, briefly here, you know, market jumps back up. Briefly here, short blip higher. Um, you know, we got into a little difficulty there. Market eventually moved higher. You can see once again, got into a little bit of difficulty. You know, market moved higher from that point going forward. The last time that we moved below the green line, uh, 
Yeah, December 2023. It was uh, October and November. We just briefly touched it, and then we uh, ripped higher. That will happen sometimes where you barely get there, and then you have that uh, tremendous move higher. A lot of times, though, you'll see when we get down there that it takes a little while to get out uh, of, of those conditions. So once again, you'll sometimes have that brief flip higher and then just a quick move like we've seen during the last few months. I would say most of the time, though, if you're going below that green line, I'm trying to be a little bit patient. I'm going long, but I'm also recognizing that it might take a little while to kind of slog through those those conditions. And you can see how we battled a little bit in 2022. Of course, that was a little bit of a bear market um, as well. Uh, so with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Are there any questions, Henry, that I can unpack or um, everything look good? I think you're you're muted right now, Henry. Yeah, I think you make a great point of, um, you know, the big question right now is if we're going to continue to deteriorate, right? Like that's what we're wondering. Right. Right. When do we get to get back on the bus? Um, and so that's what I'm going to uh, I'm going to go through my process first and foremost. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to I think Brian and I are going to hopefully answer the question. When do we get back on the bus? So just to start, you know, we've been sort of hammering home broad market sentiment context we've been pushing context the last week especially with expirations um, and then divergence finding those names um, so let me jump into my screen right now um, this is about a 15 to 20 minute process for me uh, of analyzing the data the thing i love about edge is that it sort of consolidates some decision making for me and i have some sort of internal rules that I've set up with broad market sentiment and uh, the number of components in momentum and low volatility. So uh, I have limits of where I'm able to take long or short trades um, depending on broad market sentiment. And um, as broad market sentiment, as long as this continues to decline, um, that's not a position in which I'm able to take a long, I'm able to go long. Um, so I, I, I almost put it in the desk note yesterday is like, we're looking to, to sell strength. I think I wrote it this morning is we're looking to sell strength. So, um, you know, some people are long only short only. Um, I see the process as both ways. You just need to know, uh, which way the market's moving. So, um, First of all, we start out and I check broad, broad market sentiment. I'll click on that. Brian already showed you that. So that's our, you know, the core metric. Um, the other two things that I glance at are the number of companies in momentum and the number of companies in low volatility. If you're new to Edge, I see on our chat, we have a, you know, a handful of new people. Um, these numbers are relatively low. I mean, I know... There were times when we had 26 companies, right, Brian, in momentum. When you see 26 companies uh, in momentum, you can throw a dart and you will make money. Now is the opposite. We have declining sentiment. Um, there's really not even a lot of low volatility sort of struggling on components. So those are my first sort of glances is broad market and then these two portfolios. Um, the 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 next the next thing I'll look at is our big tech portfolio. I hate to beat a dead horse here with big tech. Um, you know we've had a number of uh, you know in the last few years a number of places a number a number of drawdowns where once big tech was down in these short volume levels of 47 46 these big names these are relatively sh low short volumes. And so that's telling me that there's not a lot of, there's sort of two things. A, there's not a lot of action on either side for these, um, but it also tells me that nobody's looking to get short these names because when we do recover, um, I'm sort of waiting for a nice green day. Uh, after we have a green day, I'm going to I'm gonna look for a pullback on some of this, um, and that's when I find the buying opportunity. And a lot of that comes with um, 
again, the falling of short volumes in big tech. Um, what we're not seeing is this demand materialize. Uh, so in, until we see demand materialize for at least a day, um, sorry, I hate to be clicking back, until we see demand in both broad market and in big tech materialize, um, my concern is this line. Um, we kind of had a chance, I wrote about it yesterday, is that you know this thing ticks up, um, we'll be ready for a quick turnaround. I also mentioned uh, active traders. On occasion, um, this actually becomes an indicator for me that people like these prices and are stepping in as active traders. But um, active traders are not a massive part of the, uh, of the market, so they're not going to move it like maybe we want to. But the models will, some models will follow this active trading. So those are my first two components. Um, and then as we dig down, we get back to the main page. Um, we go to our daily trading ideas. I, I'm not going to spend a ton of time here. You know, just for the, the sake of those who read the desk note, when I'm writing, I can I'll 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 share some of these names as hey if if you're looking for action, that's all that's your uh, prerogative. Um, but even when these names are high, even especially in momentum, I'm not really looking to get long. Um, if I'm looking to get long, I'm much more likely to find something that's got low volatility. Um, and in addition to looking at the number of components, I'm looking at um, what's the risk profile, what's the volatility of the names in these. So we've, we're starting to see um, a, a couple, a handful more of these uh, big tech names show up and some tech names. Um, but again, uh, the last point I'm going to, so I'll, let me stop there. Those are really my three, uh, my th sort of the set of threes. I always top down from broad market sentiment. Um, the last thing I want to mention and I put in my desk note is uh, just the understanding of models, the understanding that six months ago, uh, the market was relatively oversold. And when we got the announcement from the Fed, it was time to sort of pile on. Um, a lot of that money, as Tim would say, is always following the models. So these models, eventually they get overweighted tech. So understanding the, the cadence of the market, but also market structure. That's why it's market structures. We recognize a lot of this money as we're going up is tied to, to ETFs um, and knowing that we're in a, at the end of the quarter um, and these short volumes are, are raising those ETFs, those bundles, they have to liquidate. They, If they're overbalanced, they have to liquidate some of those names. So um, I think the mistake is to think this was all driven by news or something else. This is driven by market structure. This move is driven by market structure. So um, I'm going to stop there before I go any further. Um, and Brian, I think uh, just sharing with us, where do we go next? Um, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, appreciate that. I, I think uh, one topic that came up in the questions had to do with the SPY and short volume. Great question. And I'll be honest, it's a little bit tricky right now. And I'll show you what uh, what I'm seeing once I get there we go. Uh, get back to edge. Need to go back in. And what we had seen for a period of time on the SPY was a very predictive signal. And let's take it back a year. Um, short volumes had averaged about 55%. That was a very consistent number. Uh, what we saw right back in the November, December timeframe, short volumes uh, just fell off a cliff. Uh, you can see that down below here. We went into the 40s, and except for a couple of brief blips higher, it has stayed that way. And generally, this has been a signal when uh, SPY short volumes have been low. It's You can see the result. It's It's been a very bullish signal for the market. Uh, now, you can see that short volumes have remained low right now for SPY, but Obviously, we've had declines in the market here uh, during the last week, week and a half. Now, obviously, this is a very short uh, period of time. 
Uh, but we would say right now, this signal currently is not working. Once again, it's a short period of time. Central tendency says low short volumes on the SPY equals gains. And I, I think we'll just have to watch and see uh, what what com happens coming out of expirations if if something fundamental has shifted. I won't say anything has right now, but this is just odd. It's odd to see low short volumes and, and weakness at the same time. So it's just something we're going to have to monitor uh, going forward. I don't have a specific answer to that question other than the fact that that it's something that I'm uh, that I'm monitoring uh, every day. Uh, in terms of the of the what's next, we'll go back to the dashboard for a second. Brian, go back to yeah, go ahead. I ask you a question. Um, Absolutely. To your point, um, how do you when in decision making and back to that short volume, how yeah. do you weight broad market sentiment? versus the movement of short volume versus the movement of short volume in spy uh, no in, in broad market or in a specific stock like you know say you yeah. have increasing sentiment on a stock but but uh, short volume is also going up which one right. do you give priority to i i give priority to sentiment um, you know, recognize that with the rules of the market and in terms of uh, market makers borrowing uh, shares, you will have periods of time. I don't have an example right in front of me. I'll just go off that for a second. Uh, you'll have periods of time where you'll have borrowing of shares where short volumes can rise for for a period. And sometimes that can stretch for a rather long time. Think of think of the meme stocks back in the day. That's exactly what was happening there. As long as demand continues to increase, you can churn through higher short volume levels. It's when demand starts to fade, that's when higher short volumes are going to start to weigh, weigh on stocks. So, you know, demand will take precedence over, uh, over short volumes in, in, in my estimation. Thanks. Great. Um, Taking it back, and I wanted to show you kind of in terms of what's what's next. And we'll circle back to, to a one-year look. What I wanted to show you was this period coming through here, and maybe that's a little bit too long. Uh, so this was the last time frame where sentiment had slipped below neutral. Uh, you can see it was right here during the green. That's during options expirations strategies changed afterwards sentiment started to rise and the market you know the market took off up until the last uh week and a half or so we've actually fallen you know below those levels now and to henry's point we have to go back to uh october to see the last time that that occurred once again we briefly went below that green line we ripped higher and once again we were we were off to the races uh, you know what happens this time? It, it, it's a it's a really good question, and I could be wrong here. I'll I'll admit that up front, but I think we're going to have to slog through this here for a little bit longer. I I don't think we're going to have this type of reaction, uh, and I'll I'll share a couple of reasons why why I, I view it that way. Uh, one, this has been a sell-off on lighter volumes. So, in other words, people haven't really been frightened in, into getting out of positions. I was looking at S&P 500 uh, volumes today. They're about 4% lighter than normal, and that's comparing the last five days to the last 50 days. So, in other words, it's been a low-volume sell-off, and sometimes – you have to shake people out. Uh, think of it as kind of a capitulation uh, event where where people get scared. And I'm, I'm not seeing people get scared yet. Uh, and a lot of times when you have those low volume sell-offs, you do have to wait for a little bit of nervousness uh, to enter the market. I'll share one other data point. And this is part of what I track every day. Uh, and what I want to show you is what was occurring in 
late October when the market actually bounced. You can see during that right ahead of the bounce, here's the returns. It was getting ugly for a period of time, similar to what we're experiencing right now. But you can see in the middle of that ugliness that the and this is this represents a little over 3,000 stocks in our universe that uh, we had every single day we had increasing numbers of companies that were bottoming in terms of market sentiment, and we had numbers uh, that were starting to decline, actually going lower. Uh, and look at what happened when we really started to uh, rip higher, and we we ripped higher just you know, snap of a finger. Look at the companies going up and they went up in in a hurry. Okay, so the setup there was a lot of companies were bottoming and then we just really started to, started to rip higher. Look at the setup right now. And the setup presently, um, we're getting just a little bit of bottoming. We actually had more bottoming about about a week ago, but that really didn't hold. Uh, we're getting a little bit of bottoming, but look at the number of companies that are still moving lower. That's a lot. Uh, look at the number of companies moving higher. Uh, it's hardly any right now. And this represents the total number of companies with sentiment five or higher. Uh, it's 41% across the market. Let's go take a quick look at what that was in October. Uh, that number had moved down. Yeah, that number was uh, 32. I wasn't. I just started to keep that data back at that time. Uh, so, to me, we're not getting enough bottoming companies yet, and we still have a lot of companies moving lower. Um, I could see us have like a a brief blip higher, and then maybe we move lower until we have that type of capitulation event. Now, once again, I could be wrong about that. Uh, we could see something like we had back in January where we hit that uh, line and then we just rip higher. And, and that could certainly happen. Brian, will you reiterate your point? Um, and I think the thesis is this, that that we're looking for liquidity. We're looking for a, because we have low, low, um, that there's low volumes we're going to find until there's a lot of volume coming into the market and a lot of traders coming and a lot of money coming back into the market until we bottom. Is that correct? And it, it goes to price, some price discoveries. Like the, the, the market makers are looking to where there's a lot of liquidity. There's a lot of transactions. And until we find that, that, that liquidity, um, we don't really turn around. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's that's part of what what I'm seeing. Uh, correct, because a lot of times you'll have these low volume sell offs where the market makers are like, hey, there's no bids there. Fine. I'll just continue to take the market lower until we run into uh, until we run into buyers. And obviously, with the market sell offs here over the last four to five days, uh, there's been very limited buy interest, especially towards the end of the day. Uh, ironically, when that's happening, a lot of times that can be. Uh, passive investors. The reason for that is they'll slant a lot of their activity towards day end. Uh, they're trying to get as close as they can to the reference price. And when we look across the S&P 500, you know, and and the Russell 3000, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of uh, of passive interest. Now, one dynamic that could change that next week. Uh, well, it's really two dynamics. One is this expirations period will end. Obviously, it's ugly right now, but you can you can just shift, you know, at the snap of a finger because we'll shift from the emphasis on the April series to the May series. And as market participants look ahead, um, they they might they might find these uh, prices attractive and it might be enough to say, hey, you know, we're going to enter into leverage, uh, you know, looking ahead to May, we're going to become more bullish now at these levels. The second thing to me that might change things is the fact that we are coming up on a lot of the big tech earnings uh, here over the next uh, week to two weeks. And market participants you know, might start to get a little bit more bullish uh, on, on big tech. So uh, personally, I think it's going to be a little bit of a slog for a few days, but I, I could be wrong if we get that snap back with May expirations on Monday. 
or if market participants start to get bullish on big tech. Right, but so to your point, Brian, is we're not there yet. The nice thing about looking at the data is that we don't really have to know. Like we can guess if it's tomorrow or if it's Monday, or even if it's not till Wednesday of next week that we see some positivity. That that will be reflected in broad broad market sentiment bottoming. Um, that right. will be that will be accompanied by an increase in the overall big tech uh, portfolio. We will start to see some names return to momentum. Until we see the culmination of those things, it's, it really doesn't make sense to go chasing. Is that mm -hmm. uh, that's how I feel? As much as like I see these prices, I go, these aren't terrible prices. Um, I, I have to wait till till those sentiments um, start to turn. Otherwise, I, you know, I'm just chasing stupid. Correct, and that's that's part of the beauty of edge to me is that you don't have to worry about chasing prices or uh, you know are are we oversold at these le levels or what have you. The edge data, to your point, will will tell us uh, you know when when that is occurring. And, you know, once again, when I get below that green line or when we get below the green line, you know, I will start to consider going, you know, going long from an SPY perspective, whether that's just, you know, buying the market, whether that's buying, you know, two times, three times leverage, whatever you're comfortable with. But that becomes uh, a very enticing position. And, you know, usually what I'll do is I'll I'll do something that I can sleep with at night. Right knowing that it's more of a long-term play uh, and, and I'll, I'll get a, get a toehold and then I'll add to that position over time. Yeah. Um, and any questions that we can address for you guys? I think we've answered the ones in the, in the meeting, uh, meeting chat. Uh, is the sentiment unique to edge? Uh, yes, it is. That's an algorithm uh, that, that's a, that's an edge algorithm. Any of the guys, Barry, Steve, John, that are on the call, uh, you guys have any questions for us today or any, any, anything to add? Nope. Just simply Not following good. the data. You know, the data yep. said sit on your hands and stay hedge. And that's what I'm doing. Kind of the inverse yep. Hicks rule. <laughs> I thought you'd be getting rich, Barry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't think you'd sit on the side during this. Well, I've been, uh, yeah, I played a few earnings, um, but uh, I definitely, uh, for me, I knew that Micron was ahead of itself, so that was probably my big short because memory is still a commodity and HBM is a niche market, so I kind of went against market structure on that one. But outside of that, it's been uh, pretty quiet, especially getting back from Vegas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, 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 can, I can bring you an update on uh, using the uh, daily sure. uh, recommendations. Obviously, if following strictly that, it would have been uh, pretty much of a bummer. But still, uh, I started this whole charting on the 22nd of March, and it's still up uh, 2%. Uh, considering where SPY has gone in the last, you know, it's down a four in that same time period, down 4.12%. Right. So we're, you know, beating SPY considerably. Uh -huh. And uh, if, and, and I'm doing this not the way I'm playing it, because as I'm playing it, I'm watching when it's going down, when it hits the buy um, uh, low volatility point at, during if when I'm watching what's going on in in the uh -huh. broad market and in spy during that time period, I'm going to let that keep going down until I see some kind of return back up at least to the nine EMA before mm -hmm. I'll buy in. And by right. doing it my own way, uh, spreading that out over a year's use, I I'm running about eighteen percent right now. So. Well, th thanks. Thanks for tracking this data, Steve. We appreciate that. It definitely works better during consolidation. Uh, you can make 200 percent using it during consolidation. Right. So. Right. 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 That's a great point, Steve. So I'll, I'll clue it, it. Does anybody else have any questions 
Otherwise, oh. um, I'll give you two. I'll, once we're done, I want to give everyone two other indicators. But if anybody has, has any other comments or questions, um, my two other indicators. One, Tim will be back from vacation. We call it the the Tim's on vacation <laughs> rule. It's a hundred percent. If he's on vacation, um, the market will go down. Number two, um, I don't want to I don't want to spoil it, but Brian is. Um, batting close to a thousand on um these sort of cyclical um bottom so uh i i, I don't want to i'm probably jinxing it by mentioning it but when i know that brian's confident in getting long um that's usually that becomes sort of a, a social signal for me um but again it's all based off of the data except him's except him's vacations that might, well, that one's a little different so yep yep <laughs> Okay. Uh, John, did you have anything to add? Oh, I was just going to say, um, you know, similar you know, to uh, the point, Steve's point about consolidation. Like if you look at the percentage of stocks that are kind of at five, that to me is a good signal of consolidation. And like what we had the last three months, you know, I know if you chart that out, you can see it. And then similar to you, I just, I think we're getting close uh, to a bottom. But the other thing too is what I've seen with the broad sediment data is we'll make a bottom and then come up and then usually make another one with the last <laughs> January was kind of rare. So uh, my sense yeah. though is, yeah, we're, we're getting close to something here. Looking yep. to buy. Yep. Can't wait. We're going to cover short soon. Right. Exactly. Well, that's good stuff, guys. Uh, thank you very much for joining today. Uh, we'll go ahead and stop the recording. If anyone wants to stick around for a couple minutes afterwards, uh, that 